Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. If you're visiting with us, uh, you can pull out that black Bible and turn in front of you and turn to page 45, go towards the back and find page 45. As we find Luke chapter 2, we'll start our study in verse 41. 41 through 52, we'll study this morning. And while you're turning there, um, some of you have probably already heard it. My mom, yesterday she fell. We're driving my sister down to Phoenix to take her to the airport. We stopped at the rest area. And she tripped over the curb and she fell. And her knee just got huge. By the time we were coming back up, uh, we stopped by and saw Eric and Lori Woods go down to Phoenix. And uh, um, I took her to the ER. She didn't break anything, praise God. But she's home now, so now she's got it up. She's on Skype. Hi, Mom. Um, she's got it up. She's trying to stay out of it for the next 24 hours, so you can pray for her. That's what she's, that's what she's doing right now. So, um, again, Luke chapter 2, verse 41, I'm going to read 41 through 52. We'll finish up chapter 2 this morning. And his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending a full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents were unaware of it. But supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And it came about that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking him, questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding, his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature. And a favor with God. And men. Speaking of my mom and my sister. I was, uh, was like eighth grade or ninth grade. After school, we would go to this little um, grocery store. It's called Constantino's. It was there in San Jose. My mom would get produce and stuff like that from Constantino's. And so, you know, it was just as normal. We would we went to Constantino's and stuff like that. Well, I was going to be the good kid or whatever I was doing. I don't know. But I decided, you know, after we unloaded all this, the groceries from the car, I was going to take the cart back inside the, the store. So I put it in the car, and I, I went up, and I put it back inside the store. And then I remember this. I remember turning around, and I'm seeing my mom and my sister drive away in the car. <laughs> now, for all of you teenagers, there's no such thing as cell phones at this time. It's 1986. Okay? <laughs> you know what that means? No cell phone? You say it with me. No, no cell, cell phone. phones. What does that mean? How'd you guys call each other? We use a thing called a home phone? Okay, no, anyways. So, so I'm watching them drive away. Okay, so now, let me, let me stop here. We were, we, we took my sister around, and, and we were in Jerome. I, I was telling my sister about the story, who, by the way, was laughing hysterically as she related the story to my older kids. Um, so then she gave her perspective. So let me give you her perspective now for everything. So she said, she, they're riding the car, they're driving. Okay? And then she's sitting there in the passenger seat up front because she always stood in front. I never was able to sit in the front. <laughs> no to that. So she's in the front seat. And you know how you can look at the side mirror and look behind you. Look at the person behind you, right? So she says she looked in, her, in the rear view mirror, in the side mirror, and she didn't look, she didn't see me. So my mom's driving. So she, said, oh. so she turned around and she's looking. And then she said, you know, my brother, he did something stupid like, oh, I was on the floor. So she then she looked on the floor. And she turned to my mom, she says, where's James? Or Jimmy, whatever my name was at that time. So, so now, now, back to, now back to my perspective. 
So I remember just sitting there. I didn't know what to do. I was mad. I think I was mad. Um, but I remember driving, them driving back. You know, they, they, they come. Now, have you ever, let me stop again. Have you ever had it where you're watching someone who's laughing and their face is plastered like that? You know, when they're laughing? It's just because they're laughing so hard. It's not back to the story. So I remember getting into the car and looking at the faces of my sister and my mom. <laughs> They're laughing hysterically. Of course, I did not think it was that funny. So they left me at Constantino's, and still today, just a few days ago, as my sister was playing the story to my older kids, she was still laughing, wasn't she? She was laughing hysterically. Oh, that was so funny. There you go, lad. It's reminding me of what we're looking at the text here, similar to our text, except the difference is, I did not voluntarily stay behind at Constantino's. Okay, that's the first big difference. Plus, second, I'm not in the place of Jesus. Amen. Plus, the parents were not laughing. They were doing anything but laughing at this situation. They were not happy. Because they did not understand who their son really was. They did not understand his mission. They did not understand what truly drove Jesus. What was his passion? What was his mission? What was his focus? And as Luke is walking us through, calling outcasts, and I say that we're outcasts on purpose because that's what we must become. We must become outcasts. We must become paupers. We must humble ourselves. To those who humble themselves, he says, come and follow Jesus. Who is he? He is Messiah, servant, son of man, Lord. And you'll find forgiveness of your sins. And then for our pastors this morning, our text, devoting yourself entirely to the Father. You will find forgiveness of your sins as you devote yourself entirely to the Father. This is the high point of, of this section in chapter 2, chapters 1 and 2 of Luke's Gospel. And really, it's actually a transition into the rest of his gospel. It's kind of like a, a search of the fortunes, priming the pump, so to speak, of what the rest of the gospel is going to be like. Just a little taste of what the rest of the gospel is going to consume you with. That Jesus was consumed with obeying his Father's will totally. Jesus has a unique relationship with the Father in that he is the very Son of God who obeyed his Father's will. In the same way, true followers of Jesus will obey the Father's will. Jesus recognized the Father's sovereignty. And he was resolved to obey the Father. He was he was consumed with wanting to do what the Father wanted him to do. And yet Mary and Joseph, as you will see in the text, they didn't understand that. They didn't understand his mission. What he had to do. And Jesus did. And that was his resolution. And that's why we read from the Gospel of John. It's one of the hallmarks you see in the Gospel of John is, is Jesus would say, I'm here to do the Father's will. This is what I wanted. This is, I'm here not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So what's the main point of the passage? The main point is this. That Jesus' unique relationship with the Father. A filial relationship which has priority over all others. It requires painful obligations. He must do what his Father had given him to do. Now, if, if we are true followers of Jesus this morning, or if you are considering today to become a follower of Jesus, we must understand an important point. We must be faithful and obedient to the call of the Father. And what's his call? His main call is to give glory to his Son, Messiah God, who has a unique attachment to the Father. You must give yourself to him alone. And Joseph and Mary, they struggled with this. They struggled to understand Jesus' task. And he was. 
And as people, excuse me, as Mary and Joseph struggled with that at that time, people struggle with that today as well. Still today, people struggle with knowing Jesus' main mission. They struggle with who he is. So as we come to this text today, and as others are asking this question just as well, what is the task of Jesus? What's his mission? What was his devotion? Ask yourself this. As a follower of Jesus, in what way do I need to obey the Father's will? If, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you believe in who Jesus claimed himself to be. From the Gospel of Luke, particularly, that we're looking at. Questions to ask yourself. So we come to our text about devoting himself entirely to the Father. There's two aspects we're going to see from Jesus for us. And the first is this, he had a hunger for godly instruction. What did it mean for him to be devoted to the Father entirely? Well, first, he had a hunger for godly instruction. There was instruction, and then he's going to put it into action. That's going to be the second point. He had instruction, he wanted godly instruction, but then he's going to put it into action. The first, the first aspect. What does it mean if you devote yourself entirely to the Father? What does it mean? You don't have a passion, a hunger for godly instruction. 41 begins. His parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. The Old Testament commanded Israel to come to Jerusalem for three festivals. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Now, the problem is many Jews, they live so far away they were only able to come to one, and the one that they really came to, especially the pious ones, they would come to Passover. And the city would be packed out. At that time, you would have sometimes up to 200,000 people for a city of maybe 20, 30,000 people, or 30, maybe 40, 50,000, and then you, know, you triple that. And notice, it said each year they would come up. And, and what, it says come up because Jerusalem was on a mountain. That's why it says come up. And they would make the yearly pilgrimage, showing their piety and their devotion. Again, we mentioned this last week. Notice the importance of their faithfulness to the law. And Passover was the miraculous deliverance of the nation from their slavery to Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, which led to the Exodus. And technically, only men were required to go, so for a woman to go, it showed great devotion. And you didn't just hop in the car and drive a couple hours. Cars were scarce in those days. Okay, got a little couple of things. It was an 80-mile trip from Nazareth. And since roads were really good hiding spots for robbers, they traveled in caravans for protection. That's why you read about that book. Uh, there in verse 44, looking for them in the caravan. They, they traveled, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, who knows, 50 people. They did that on purpose, but there'd be more protection for them. 42, and when he became 12, he went up according to the custom of the feast. Now, here's Jesus, 12 years old. One year before the normal age, a Jewish boy would be, quote unquote, responsible before God. At age 13, a Jewish boy could become a, quote, son of the commandments, or a full member of the synagogue. Some of them even mentioned the fact that even at that point, at 13, 14 years old, the boys were able to get married. So here's Jesus, 12 years old, and he'd be facing intense, intense teaching this last year before he turned 13. Now, this the the some of you might have heard of the bar mitzvah custom. Uh, that didn't come until after Jesus' time, but, but it's still in that same vein. Okay? But again, notice. Jesus' parents, the faithful Jews who, who instructed their son in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 26 and 27, the Lord said, when your son comes to you and says, why do we do this? You would tell him this and tell him the whole story about Passover, whole story about the, the, the Exodus 
So here's Joseph. He's, he's teaching that to Jesus. Wouldn't that be weird? You're teaching your son, and yet he's the one who's going to be the Passover. Oh, interesting. 43, 44, as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents were unaware of it. It seems that Jesus and his parents had stayed for the whole seven-day celebration. And notice in 44, but supposed to be in the caravan over the day's journey, they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. You assume he was with relatives, with others. So they didn't worry about him for, for a day's journey. Now we might say, well, that's like, that's like freaky. I mean, how come they weren't dead? They're, they're with the, uh, the, your friends and cousins and everything. That guy's not having a good time. Man. But he stayed behind. You know, he was the one who did that. And they were unaware. Now, now some say, oh, the parents were to blame for that. Well, you know, the text doesn't really say that. We're assuming things from the text on that point. Luke doesn't make any effort to shift any blame. He just simply gives you the historical account of what happened. But see, there's something else that comes up. Did Jesus sin by doing this? Did Jesus sin by doing this? No. I don't think so, because other passages of Scripture says he never sinned. Hebrews chapter 4. Yet without sin... Chapter 7 of Hebrews. John 8, 46. Which one of you accused me of sin? Jesus said. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, uh, no deceit was found in his mouth. So how do you explain this? Our kid Hughes, he said it really well. Uh, Jesus' glory was veiled on purpose. And so as it was, he was capable of unknowingly causing them distress. And since he was sinless, he was incapable of knowingly causing them distress, of knowingly doing this to them. But one thing we definitely do know, what we'll find out, he was engulfed with the spiritualization of who he truly was. He knew who he was. He was engulfed with that. He was consumed by that. So they assumed he was with the others, the caravan. Confidently assumed he was safe with family and friends. And so they started looking for him. And they became worried. He can be found. So notice. They didn't find him. They returned to Jerusalem looking for him in verse 45. Quote, says one writer, they anxiously hunted for the missing child. 46. It came about after they after that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Three days after the caravan started home, they finally found him. There he was, sitting at the feet of the teachers in the temple. And we're not told where. I just picture that they're running by. Right? Now students normally sat with their teachers to listen to their instruction. That was a normal thing. And the custom amongst Judaism would be a question and answer dialogue with their teachers, with their instructors, with, with the one that was mentoring them. This is the only time you see Jesus doing this. So right now, Jesus was a listener and a learner, not a teacher. He had a thirst for knowledge and understanding regarding spiritual things. Yet, he was definitely aware he was more than a pupil, and yet, he was not exercising omniscience or teaching them. He wasn't doing that. That's not what the text says. Yet, he had profound insight. He was listening to them and asking them questions. And then, 47. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Not only was he asking questions and answering their questions, but the teachers were shocked at his astuteness. His wisdom baffled the crowd, giving them a high, giving him a high respect amongst them. They were amazed that a young boy 
boy his age was able to deduce such things from the Old Testament in ways they'd never even seen before. And yet, one writer said this, quote, one day his questions will pierce the very core of their religious establishment and he will give answers to his own questions, end quote. He would end up standing these religious leaders on their head because he would challenge them about who he was and how, he could, how they could be made right with God, not by their laws, not by doing this and doing this, but by believing in him, by trusting in him, yes, that's how. He would stand them all on their heads. So he's doing this. 48, when they saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father had been anxious and looking for you. They found Jesus. Imagine the feelings that they felt. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, 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 right, you know? They're shocked, they're relieved, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> All at the same time, Jesus had brought trouble to his parents, as far as they were concerned. They searched for him, notice she says, been anxiously looking. The word means deep mental pain, trauma. It's suffering, pain. We were searching for you, frantically. Where is that darn kid? Your feelings were hurt. So notice there's a bit of a reproach and a question to her son. Why did you do such an insensitive thing to us, Jesus? Hmm. Maybe it was the beginning of the fulfillment of Simeon's prophecy. Pain, a sword will pierce your own soul there. And then you have the first words of our Lord. He said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? The first words of our Lord was revealed his sense of priority. His focus task. And notice the first part they just read. First he asked, well, why were you searching for me? And I, I read it in that way because how it's written, it's almost insinuating, well, you guys should have known where I was. I mean, like, duh. They should have, they should have produced an affirmative reply. I'm supposed to be about the work of my father, what he desired for me, right? Right? We all, we all know this, right? Yeah. See? But then the second part is even stronger. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? I had to be. In the Greek, this one word is called de, delta epsilon iota, D-E-I. And it means it is necessary. This must happen. This has to happen. Luke is notorious for using this word. You'll see it everywhere in his gospel. Day. Day. It must happen. It's necessary. Day. Did you not know I had to do this? In, in, in reference to his relationship with his father, I have to do this. But yet it's interesting though, his father's what? Because in your Bibles, house should be italicized, right? Or if you have a King James or New King James, it has business, right? But that's italicized. Why? Because it's not in the original. It just says, be in the house, be in the of my father. That's how it says in the Greek. Be in the of my father. And the what? Uh, now, some translations say the KJV, New King James, they say business. But that's kind of weird because couldn't Jesus do his father's business outside the temple? Well, yeah. I mean, his whole ministry is going to be about doing business outside the temple, right? Okay, so, what, so business is like, we'll kick that one. 
New American Standard, and I think ESV and Holman Christian Standard. All three of those, even NIV too, I think. It says Father's house. And I think that's probably what he meant by that. Given the fact, because he says, in the of my father. So in something, and given a sense, where was he? He was in the temple. And since he was in the temple, that seems most likely to be the case. He needed to be in God's house. The temple was decidedly where God resided with his people, where instruction about God was given in the temple. And I'm going to bring this up later on. This is not God's house. This is, this is a building. This is not any holier place than your bathroom. It's true. But here, as you're talking about, for Jew, for, for Judaism, the temple was where God resided. It was the temple. I had to be in the house of oh, who? My father. You never see this in the Old Testament. It's nowhere in the Old Testament. Nowhere would an Old Testament saint say, my father. It would chuck a stone at your head if you did that. None of the Old Testament saints ever spoke of God as my father. This in and of itself was shocking to them. So put all of these things together. Well, I mean, duh, I'm supposed to be in here. Did, did you know I had to be in my father's house? meant that he had an intimate, personal relationship with the Father, not just a messianic relationship. He knew he was sent by the Father to reveal the Father's will. See, it went way beyond just a Jewish boy being conscientious of the law. He knew exactly who he was. And since he had a close intimate relationship with the Father and was to carry out his mission. Therefore, he was called to learn all that he could because he would eventually instruct all mankind in the wisdom of God because he was and is God. This statement completely sets Jesus apart from just being a prophet my Muslim friend. My Muslim friend, you do not understand. A filial relationship with the Father, an intimate, personal relationship with the Father, my Father, this is the very Son of God, or may I say, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. just as well. His parents needed to understand this was his mission, and so do we. In other words, following God's will took priority for Jesus, and that should be our priority as well. It should be your priority. <clears throat> Mary and Joseph and Fifi, they didn't understand the statement she made them. Huh? What? confused. They didn't get it. Now some say, oh, come on, this is totally weird. How could they not get it? They should have known. Well, not really. We would think the disciples should have figured it out, right? Even the disciples didn't figure it out. They were slow to fully realize who he was. I mean, at the end in the Gospel of John, finally, at the final discourse, they say, Lo, behold, we believe you come from God. Jesus said, Finally? <laughs> what took you guys so long? <coughs> Even they were slow. To understand and embrace Jesus for who he was and his earthly mission was not just a problem for his parents, but for the disciples. It continues on today. People just don't understand who he is. They understand, don't understand what his mission was. Remember who Jesus is not. 
Jesus is not some culture shaper. He's not the popular cool guy, a man's man. He's not a patriot for his country. Waving the Israeli flag. Israel needs their land. He's not that. He's not the best religious organizer. He's not an earth lover. He's not a Marxist. He's not a social reformer. He didn't just teach us how to love, man. No. He was and is God the Son who came to rescue sinners so you can have forgiveness. That's who he is. He calls us to devote ourselves to this same Father. So now we can say, My Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Did Jesus knew who he was? Getting over to verse 52, skipping 51, Jesus kept increasing wisdom, stature, favor with God, and then he grew in wisdom. How, how does God the Son grow in wisdom? Didn't he possess all wisdom? Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He veiled his glory. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, he learned obedience. And as he grew older, he learned what it meant to devote himself entirely to the Father. He continued in that, in wisdom, fearing the Lord. He grew in the fear of the Lord. That, the fear of the Lord is that's the beginning of wisdom, right? Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. He grew in maturity. He grew in God's favor and that it was upon him moral growth, a favorable place with God. He was grace in his relationship with the Father and he was grace in his relationship with people. Jesus had a hunger for godly instruction. But notice, this godly instruction, just this relationship that he had with the Father, it didn't just stop there. It did something. The second part of this, he had a life of practical action. Not just godly instruction and hunger for, but a life of practical action. In 51, that's when we go to 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. His mother treasured all of these things in her heart. He left with them back to Nazareth, and was absolutely submissive to them in everything. Now, given who he was, that's the reason for this significance. Though he was human, he was deity. Though he was deity, he was truly human. Perfect, and yet tempted as we are. And yet without sin, totally without sin. And yet he stood out from others. He put this knowledge, this instruction, into practice. It's not just a cognitive thing. It's not just a head thing. It's not just gaining insight. He puts wisdom into practice by obeying his earthly authority. See, our instruction should not just be cerebral. It comes out in words, in actions. This is our call to action from our instruction. What should be our priorities from the Father? There's a few. There's just some. There's more, I would think. Daily prayer, Bible reading. Consistent evangelism in your life. Getting connected to a local church. Pursuit of holiness in your relations with others. Obeying leaders, those in authority over you. Those are just a few. These are the priorities from the Father for us. Jesus knew who he was, and he still obeyed his earthly authority. And then Mary's response, she treasured these words, literally. All words in her heart. Similar to her response when the shepherds came. Now this ups the ante a little bit. She carefully recalled his submission to mine. Kind of helps restore her reputation. 
to, from the response she had to him earlier when she reprimanded him. What in the world are you doing, kid? Here he comes, and he's obedient to her and to Joseph. Now she's really thinking. She didn't understand, and she won't understand until later. After he's resurrected, then she'll believe. But she also didn't forget. And then you have between 52 and then chapter 3, almost 20 years. And so they think that sometime in that period, Joseph dies. And so it's like the chapter closes, um, similar to when the screen goes black for a movie. There's a large scene, the screen goes black, and then a whole other uh, act or another section of the movie takes place. This is what's happening here in chapter, 50, in chapter 2, 52. kind of closes. And then we'll open up next week, so we go to chapter 3. Now, there's tw almost 20 years later, a whole new scene comes on the scene, or on the set. As to who this Jesus will turn out to be in the rest of Luke's gospel. So consider who this Jesus is. By the remarkable words from the mouth of a 12 year old, his sonship demanded that he be in the house of his father discussing these things with the religious teachers. All of us have to wrestle with his identity. And we must decide who this Jesus really is. Will we believe it? Do we believe it? Will we reject it? And, and for us, as Christians, this passage helps us to gauge our commitment, our devotion, our focus upon the Father's will. What is His will for my life? How committed am I to doing His will? Day it is necessary. Day. end with this. It should be our job to be with God's house. Notice I didn't say in. This is not God's house. This is God's house. God's house is not people. We are the new temple. It's us. So this text should encourage you should exhort all of us to make sure that if we call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ, we should make his house, the local church, a vital, important aspect. It should be important to us. And with God's people. It's been a good, good time for us to, to ponder, to think, see what we've seen in God's word here at the end of chapter 2. And, and then you're going to begin now to prepare your heart, examine your heart, because we're going to prepare ourselves to take the Lord's Supper together.